welcome to this morning's Open Caucus focusing on child well-being in Canada. I'm Senator Jane Cordy. I'm from Nova Scotia. Beside me is the co-chair, Senator Raymond Garnier from Manitoba. The Open Caucus is a forum for discussion on issues of national importance. This meeting is co-sponsored by the Independent Senators Group, the Independent Senate Liberal Group, and the Government Representative Office in the Senate. This nonpartisan discussion is open to all parliamentarians, to staff, to media, and to the public. So invitations have gone out to all senators, regardless of your political affiliation or not, and to members of parliament on the other side. Canada continues to fall behind as compared with other delayed countries when it comes to child well-being. According to a recent child study, suicide is the second leading cause of death among children. Child mental health related hospitalization rates are increasing and approximately one in five Canadian children continue to live in poverty. With Canada being ranked as the eighth most prosperous nation in the world, there is a wide and worrying gap between the economic well-being of the nation and the well-being of our children. In light of National Child's Day on November 20th, we ask the experts who join us today what measures can be taken to improve and protect child well-being in Canada. And on that note, I would like to thank Senators Munson, Senator O, oh, Senator Gagne, my co-chair this morning, and Senator Martin for the work that they do every year to celebrate National Child's Day. And this morning, they hosted a reception for exceptional children from the Ottawa area in the Parliament of Canada, and I was pleased to be there to join them. I'd like to also I don't usually introduce people from the audience, but today it's really special and we're very pleased to have former Senator Landon Pearson with us. Senator Pearson is a lifelong, lifelong advocate for the rights of the child. So welcome to you, Senator Pearson. Before we start the meeting, just a few housekeeping matters. There's coffee available at the back of the room for anybody who would like it. Translation is available. Please use the headsets that are located in your chairs for audience members. Channel 1 is for English and Channel 2 is for French. We encourage audience participation. If you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please let the Open Caucus coordinator, Sarah Paulwin, know. And Sarah is waving her arm over there. So if you wish to participate either with a question or with a comment, just let Sarah know and she will give us your name. I'd like now for my co-chair, Senator Gagné, to say a few words. Merci, uh, Senatrice uh, Cordy, et je suis uh, ravie de me joindre à vous à titre de co. Thank you, Senator Cordy. I'm delighted to be the co-president of this open caucus. I hope that you'll be patient with me because this is new to me this morning. Now, the subject of the day, the well-being of children in Canada, affects all of us. I had the honor as Senator Cordy mentioned earlier, to participate with my colleagues, Senator Jim Munson, Yona Martin, and Victor O, oh, in the parliamentary breakfast on the occasion of National Child's Day, where I presided over the meeting. I would like to thank the experts who are participating in today's panel. I must admit that after more than 35 years in the field of education before arriving in the Senate, I look at every initiative, every bill, with one question in mind, and that is, what effect could this have on the lives of our children, both today and tomorrow? And I hope that this is a question that all, que that all senators ask. Senator Cordy mentioned the certain challenges that we have in Canada, namely those mentioned in the study conducted by Campaign 2000. This study revealed that more than 17% of children live in poverty in Canada. More than 37% of them are First Nations children. This is an issue that affects both urban and rural settings, and it is deeply unacceptable. I know that our experts will be able to further our reflection, whether it be on current issues or possible solutions that we may all consider. Senator Cordy. 
have a wonderful panel with us this morning. We'll introduce, we'll give you the bios first so that then once we start uh, speaking, we'll just introduce them. Uh, we've got Dr. Amy Metcalf. She's an assistant professor in the departments of obstetrics and gynecology, community health sciences and medicine at the University of Calgary. She's also an active member of the Alberta Children's Hospital Research Institute, the O'Brien Institute for Public Health, and the Libin Cardiovascular Institute of Alberta. Dr. Metcalf's program of research focuses on examining trends in women's and children's health in Canada and evaluating interventions to improve health, comes, health outcomes for women and children. She was one of the authors of the Raising Canada Report for Children's First Canada. Accompanying Dr. Metcalf this morning is Stephanie Mitten, and Stephanie is an experienced government relations specialist who has spent her career advocating for issues related to youth, ranging from international development to children's health and education. Stephanie holds a Bachelor of Public Affairs and Policy Management from Carleton University and a Master's Degree in International Public Policy from Wilfrid Laurier University. Stephanie joins us today as a representative of Children First Canada. It is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Pamela Lovelace. Welcome. Ms. Lovelace is project manager with Wisdom to Action, a national knowledge mobilization initiative funded by the Government of Canada through the Network of Centres of Excellence under the direction of the scientific director, Dr. Michael Unger. Canada Research Chair in Child, Family and Community Resilience at the Resilience Research Centre at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She has convened youth hosts to lead conversations during National Child Day, events in Toronto and in Ottawa, on behalf of Children First Canada and the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children. Andrea Ogier was raised in Thunder Bay, Ontario. She's Ojibwe and a member of the Pays Platt First Nations. She's, she joined the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society in 2008 to work on the Touchstones of Hope, and she's also editor of the First People's Child and Family Review. With her background in education, Andrea is passionate about teaching, mentoring, and learning from others, especially from our children, youth, and elders. Her main areas of interest include engagement in reconciliation, reconciliation approaches, child and youth engagement, and human rights. It is with pleasure that I introduce Kathy Vandergrift. She chairs the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children, which is a national network that promotes respect for the rights of children across Canada. Ms. Vandergrift brings more than 20 years of work on implementing children's rights. From countries in conflict to Canada, she also brings many years of experience as a policy analyst for municipal and federal governments and NGOs. In 2008, Kathy received the Aldo Farina Award for Child Rights Advocacy and International Development Education from UNICEF's International Board. And we'll begin with Dr. Amy Metcalf. Well, thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. Bonjour tout le monde. We are grateful for the important work that you're doing in the Senate. Today's meeting certainly speaks volumes to your commitment to improving the lives of Canada's youngest citizens. Children First Canada has a bold and ambitious vision to make Canada the best place in the world for kids to grow up. We are a national movement that unites children's charities, hospitals, research institutions, and major corporations and children themselves. Together we speak with a united voice and are taking the lead in building public awareness and promoting public policies that ensure our children's well-being and the protection of their rights. The harsh truth is that Canada is far from being a world-leading country for kids to grow up. While we are the eighth most proper, prosperous nation in the world, Canada ranks 25th out of 41 affluent nations for children's well-being, according to UNICEF. 
In a current report prepared for Children's First Canada by the O'Brien Institute for Public Health, there are deeply worrisome trends that require immediate action. Dr. Metcalf is going to highlight uh, the findings of the report. Thank you, Stephanie. Compared to other OECD nations, Canada consistently ranks poorly when comparing child health statistics. Importantly, many of these adverse outcomes are potentially preventable. Unintentional injuries remain the leading cause of death for children in Canada due to gaps in law and enforcement on matters such as booster seats, bicycle helmets, and off-road off vehicle, off vehicle safety regulations. Canada has one of the highest teenage suicide rates internationally, with an estimated rate of more than 10 suicides per 100,000 teenagers. And suicide is unfortunately just the tip of the iceberg. Up to one in five children may develop a mental health disorder, but sadly only 20% of them are able to receive appropriate treatment in their communities. And many other issues related to poor mental health may prevent children and youth from seeking, from seeking help. Self-reported surveys indicate that 20% of children report that they've personally experienced cyberbullying, cyberstalking, or both. And perhaps most disturbingly, one third of Canadian adults report that they personally have experienced child abuse. It is estimated that 1.2 million children in Canada currently live in low-income households, and that 10% of families with children under the age of six report some level of food insecurity. Poverty places children at risk of developmental vulnerability, with approximately one-third of children from low-income neighborhoods not meeting all of their developmental milestones before they enter the first grade. Nutrition, physical activity, and weight also continue to need attention, with more than 25% of youth being overweight or obese. And importantly, only 35% of Canadian children and youth meet, meet the recommended physical activity recommendations. Ultimately, many kids in Canada grow up healthy and safe. However, these data show us that there's still considerable room for improvement. Thank you, Amy. The release of the Raising Canada report resulted in more than 700 unique media stories. Along with the report, we released a call to action signed by the heads of Canada's leading children's charities, kids hospitals, research institutes, and major corporations. Together, we're calling for three areas of urgent action. First, we believe that every child deserves a champion, and we support the long-standing call to establish a national commission for children and youth. The commission should be established as an independent office of government with a mandate to raise the profile of children in Canada, promote the rights and best practices of children with government, and hold them accountable, and speak with, on, and behalf of children. In order for the commission to address the health and well-being of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children and youth, it will need appropriate representation and support. We encourage the federal government to work nation to nation, respecting and including the self-governance rights of Indigenous peoples when considering this proposal. Second, we believe that every child needs resources to thrive, and we call for a federal children's budget. The children's budget will track the national funding that is allocated and invested in children to ensure that equitable distribution of resources and ensure that funding is being allocated to evidence-based solutions for children. It should also include comparative funding for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children and youth on and off reserve. Finally, we believe that every child has rights, and we call for support of the Canadian Children's Charter. We call for the full implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Canadian Children's Charter. The new Canadian Children's Charter, created with input from thousands of children and youth across the country, lays a roadmap for urgent action to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights of every child in Canada. The initial draft of the Canadian Children's Charter was created by children and youth at the National Children's Summit in Ottawa in November 2017 and further refined at a forum in June 2018. The final draft will be presented at a special event on National Child Day, November 20th, 2018 in Toronto. You're all invited to join us at the event. At the forum, youth will participate in workshops and hear from inspirational speakers. Adult leaders are invited to join the youth delegates over lunch and to hear from the youth directly. Canadians support these important and much needed investments in children. Nearly 90% of Canadians say that investing in children will pay off and save the need for additional expenditures in the future. For every $1 invested in the early years of a child's life, you can save up to $9 in future spending on health care. Many of you know our founder, Sarah Austin. Sarah would have loved to have been here today, but had prior commitments. 
At the very present moment, Canada must report to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in 2018 on the status of Canada's children and the implementation of their rights. Children First Canada is preparing its own submission that will be informed by the Children's Charter and the Raising Canada report. We are at a unique moment in time to reflect on the progress and create a plan of action to ensure that every child in Canada can achieve their full potential. The good news is that change is possible and we don't have to start from scratch. We know what's working, we know what steps are necessary to help Canada improve the lives of our youngest citizens. Will you join us in raising Canada? Merci pour votre temps aujourd'hui. Merci, Madame Lovelace. Thank you, Ms. Lovelace. Thank you, merci. Honorable Senators, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. I will share with you the work of Wisdom to Action at Dalhousie University in Halifax to support the mental health and well-being of children and youth in challenging contexts. I will ask you to support the full implementation of children's rights, which we believe is in the best interest of all Canadians. Wisdom to Action was founded as uh, the Children and Youth in Challenging Contexts. Um, in 2011, through the federal government's Networks of Centers of Excellence Knowledge Mobilization Network program, with a funding of $2.8 million over seven years. Since the beginning of this uh, initiative, we focused on engaging community-based nonprofit organizations in knowledge mobilization to strengthen their program capacity, to use evidence and evaluation, and to undertake youth and community engagement. We believe in the role and potential of a wide range of service providers and systems to provide services and programs that promote mental health, well-being, and resilience through addressing the issues that are broader than clinical and mental health services. So it's through these organizations that provide support in employment, education, recreation, peer-to-peer uh, -peer programs, the arts, and others that we believe young people build their own well-being and resilience. Our mandate is to expand the use of evidence and evaluation to increase capacity and effectiveness among those working with children and youth, their families and communities, with a vision that more effective programs will lead to improved outcomes. Over the past seven years, we have partnered with researchers, service providers, youth, educators, government, uh, policymakers, and healthcare professionals to share what works for marginalized young people. Just trying to pause my, I'm uh, uh, trying to pause. Sorry about that. Is there a pause button? Um, my apologies. Uh, so we've, we've partnered with these diverse organizations and communities from coast to coast to identify what is working and for whom and what is needed and how to build those connections for future collaboration across all systems and all sectors so systemic change becomes sustainable. So Wisdom to Action has produced knowledge mobilization synthesis reports similar to this. And um, within these uh, summary documents, we also have policy checklists which can support organizations uh, quite easily and be implemented. Uh, they're available both in French and English on our website. And including, in, in addition to these uh, reports and summary documents, we've produced close to 100 online videos. They're available on YouTube at Wisdom to Action. We also developed an online knowledge mobilization and evaluation toolkit, which is available on our website for any organization to use. Um, we've created webinars, first independently, and then through an ongoing collaboration with the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centres that facilitated greater reach um, with several webinars with thousands of participants. Wisdom to Action has mentored over two dozen organizations over the years to increase their capacity to use research evidence and undertake evaluation and youth engagement. We have engaged approximately 2,400 graduate and undergraduate students through our events, our mentoring program, knowledge synthesis work, training, and other projects. Helping new researchers engage with youth and communities to share research evidence and integrate practice evidence and lived experience. 
So since 2013, and you'll see uh, a little bit of an overview uh, next to you, this is an explanation, a visual uh, representation of the kinds of uh, activities that we host during our events. So we have hosted 18 Wisdom to Action community learning events from coast to coast to coast in Canada, including one in Geneva, Switzerland this past uh, summer. Uh, these events are held on a range of local and national issues, and we've reached approximately 3,000 participants directly. We've also provided dozens of seminars and workshops across the country to, to diverse stakeholders on knowledge mobilization, youth engagement, evaluation. The participants have overwhelmingly reported during the evaluations of our events that they made new connections, they gained new knowledge directly applicable to their work with young people. In February 2018, we hosted Wisdom to Action Embrace Life to look at youth-led suicide prevention initiatives in Canada. This event was held in Vancouver. It attracted participants from across the country, including uh, many First Nations, Inuit, Métis, rural and remote communities uh, across Canada and in Canada's north. Uh, they, had, uh, they had experienced, many of these communities had experienced multiple deaths by suicide of young people. So with our participatory planning and transparent, inclusive communications process, we ensured that we provided professional mental health support, um, First Nations and Inuit elder support at these events, and peer support from a diverse group of young people. We've uh, written a report on this event, which is available, uh, and I will leave it here, and I, I have extra copies if you would like one. So whether we're working with a team from across Nunavut or a multilingual team in Montreal or participatory approach, our participatory approach has engaged communities and youth in identifying their priority issues and accessing practice ideas and evidence from across the country while focusing on what is working in the local context. So each event, along with our methodology, the collective wisdom gathered, uh, the, the collective wisdom has been gathered in print, in video, um, in conversations, and, uh, and, and photographs, and then we share that at future workshops and events um, and activities and publications. So as you can see, from the breadth of our work we have accomplished over the last eight years, Wisdom to Action has been creating significant change within the youth serving uh, sector across Canada to better serve and respond to the needs of young Canadians. Our recent work with Children First Canada, which you just heard about, um, we hosted a national children's summit last year to develop the children's charter with youth who they provided uh, their viewpoint, their perspective, which uh, then developed, was used to develop the children's charter. Um, and that children's charter recognizes the importance of the full implementation of their rights in Canada. Now, as I, I just returned uh, from St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, I attended the National Suicide Prevention Conference. Um, and I'm sure you will all agree that we are, we need dire, uh, we're, we def, sorry, we desperately need change when it comes to suicide prevention initiatives across this country. We need a whole of government to respond to the rising rate of suicide of children and youth. A response that truly puts the well-being of children first and sets aside the political agendas so that we, the government, is acting at all times in the best interest of all Canadians and the best interest of all children. So our work uh, to hold Raise the Bar, Children's uh, Rights in Canada Conference with my colleague here, which you'll be hearing from shortly, Kathy Vandergrift, We'll be here in Ottawa, November 21st and 22nd, with the Canadian Coalition uh, for the Rights of the Children. And that is yet another example of the work that we do and our efforts to create systemic change for the well-being of all children. Like many other organizations and individuals in Canada, Wisdom to Action is looking forward to reading Canada's report to the UN Committee, which I, we understand was due this past July and hopefully will be presented uh, in the near future. But we have to um, work better together to ensure the full implementation 
of children's rights in Canada. And as we heard uh, from the Raising Canada report, it's clear that many UN committee recommendations made to Canada in 2012 have still not been implemented. And one such recommendation, recommendation number 66, which states, and I quote, the committee recommends that the state party strengthen and expand the quality of interventions to prevent suicide among children with particular attention to early detection. So six years later, since the UN's recommendations, more of Canada's children are being lost to suicide. Action is desperately needed. So at Wisdom to Action, we believe this current UN review process could change the course for the well-being of children and youth, their families, their communities, for the better. We believe, honorable senators, that you would agree that the best interest of children includes their rights being fully realized, fully implemented in Canada by our government. So we respectfully request your support and agreement that the best interest of the child is the full implementation of rights of all children in Canada. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Loveless. Our next uh, witness this morning is Andrea Auger. Good morning. I would like to acknowledge that we sit on a traditional Algonquin unceded territory. I would like to acknowledge all of the honorable senators and guests who have taken the time to listen to the panelists this morning on this important issue of child rights in Canada. I am so honored to sit with my colleagues and all of you to talk about the importance of First Nations children and the importance of ensuring that First Nations children have the same opportunities to succeed as all other children in Canada. According to the Kids' Rights Index, Canada sits 52nd overall. But when we look at child, right envi child rights environment, pardon me, we sit 138 to 144 out of 183 countries in the, in the, in the world. In terms of um, the child right index, it looks at things like non-discrimination and best interests of the child. We know at the Caring Society that the Government of Canada has a long-standing pattern of discrimination against First Nations children. And it's a long-standing pattern in terms of its policies, its ideologies, and practices. Child welfare was the number one call to action with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And this involves one of our most vulnerable um, populations of children in the country, which is First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children. They're overrepresented by about 52%, according to Statistics Canada, in terms of all of the children who are in, the, in care of child welfare. We know that there has been discrimination. It was found in 2016 by a ruling from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal that said that the government discriminates against First Nations children and has been doing so for many years in its policies and practices by giving less child welfare funding to First Nations children on reserves. Since that time, two years ago, the case has been ongoing since 2007 when it was filed, but we know that this discrimination was happening long before that. We see the National Policy Review in, in the year 2000, the Wande reports in 2005, the ruling in 2007, 2016. The discrimination is still ongoing. We know that there's been five non-compliance orders with the Canadian, from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal against the Government of Canada for failing to implement Jordan's principle, which is a child-first principle ensuring that all First Nations children get the services that they need, not just child welfare services, health services, but it also applies to things like education and all other public service, fu publicly funded services that other children in this country receive that First Nations kids are not receiving currently. We know that the tribunal has also ordered in its compliance orders that the government of Canada fund child welfare services on actuals because we don't actually know what the gap is because child welfare agencies that were created to provide culturally relevant services to First Nations children were operating off the funding formulas that they were given. 
We don't know what the, the shortfall is for First Nations kids, but it's estimated to be about 30% less than what others get in the country. We also want to make sure that First Nations children receive these services in ways that, are, that recognize that there are ongoing patterns of um, intergenerational impacts, things that affect First Nations kids that others may not experience in the country, as we know from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final reports. So we want to ensure substantive equality. We believe at the Caring Society that in order for substantive, meaningful change to occur, that there needs to be a reform of the Government of Canada. We believe that the Government of Canada needs to implement the orders from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal in order to ensure that First Nations children are receiving the services that they need, including um, having the agencies be up to par with other agencies across the country, including factoring in substantive equality. The Spirit Bear Plan also requests that there be a, um, a costing exercise that the parliamentary budget, budget officer um, publicly cost out all the shortfalls in things like education, health, water, child welfare. Because we know that all of these things and all of these shortfalls affect First Nations children. It's not just about child welfare, it's about ensuring that they have access to clean water, access to food that others in the country have as well and especially access to education, which is so important for all of our children in the country. We also believe that there needs to be a 360 evaluation of the government departments that deliver services to First Nations children. Staff need to be trained in terms of um, looking at how the government has been discriminatory in its ideologies and policies throughout the years and also learning about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. So in terms of um, the Spirit Bear Plan, we believe that the Spirit Bear Plan is the way forward and that the government create its own Spirit, Spirit Bear Plan to ensure that First Nations kids receive those services. And most importantly, I know that everyone here is able to do something in their own capacity and I believe that is up to all of us to make a difference for First Nations children. So with that, I thank you so much for listening and I hope that we can make some headway with the Spirit Bear Plan. Thank you so much. Madame Auger, merci de votre présentation. Ms. Auger, thank you for your presentation. I will now give the floor to Ms. Vandergrift. Thank you very much. It is indeed an honor to be part of this important discussion. I would like to focus on the opportunity that's before us right now to address some of the concerns highlighted by the other panelists this morning. The Senate has championed children's rights in the past. It can play an important role again in the current review that Canada is undergoing. I would like to look at some of the benefits of the convention. Sorry. I want, I want to focus today on how children's rights can make Canada work better. We're going to look at the review as an opportunity, some of the benefits of the convention, and some of the implementation challenges we have in Canada. This is technically the fifth, sixth official review. Um, it's really the fourth time, but don't worry about the numbers. What we need to focus on is using this review to make a change in Canada. Mm -hmm. The re government's report is already four months late. Last time it was a year late. Does that reflect children's rights are a high priority? We won't uh, likely see it before our meeting, although we had been promised it and it was due in July. It's time to take seriously the recommendations from earlier reports. This is the fourth round. We need to make this round productive to make real gains for children in Canada, not just a report to a UN committee that's then buried. What are the benefits of the convention, of using the convention? It provides a comprehensive framework for policies that affect children. Children's lives don't look like government departments. The convention pulls it together. It puts, looks at the whole child as a person with rights, not an object of charity. And the goal is to develop the full potential of every child, which is a benefit to our country as well. 
The convention is also very helpful for the transition from childhood to adulthood, which is at the center of many of your current issues um, at the Senate as well, because it looks at the evolving capacities of the child. There are specific benefits for Canada. There's a focus on outcomes, not how much money or who pays the bill, which we fight about a lot in Canada. It looks at outcomes for children and measures those. And you can be flexible about the means. It provides tools for monitoring and implementation. If we had done that, we wouldn't have needed this court case to bring us to bear. All provinces have ratified the convention. All areas of children's policy involve both federal and provincial governments in some way. So you can use implementation of the convention to make Canadian federalism work better we hear about gaps all the time, but if we implemented the convention, we could help with that. So what's been the problem for 27 years? What is our challenge? Well, I would submit to you there's no good excuse for our uh, limited progress. I think there are f three factors to discuss going forward. One is indeed the culture. <coughs> there still is a lack of awareness among children and among families there is some fear that, um, based on misunderstanding. There is a need for political will and persistence. The Senate has shown political will from time to time. Now I think it's time for persistence in pushing through till we actually get the changes we want. There are some structural barriers, but what we have learned throughout these years is that the shame and blame game does not work. I've been on this issue for more than 20 years. You speak to federal officials, that's the province's jurisdiction. You talk to the provinces, tell the federal government to give us more money and we'll do it. And the outcome is nothing happens. I think the convention can get us past that shame and blame game if we look at children's rights as an asset mm -hmm. and as a way to do it better. Quickly reviewing the basic principles in the convention, we've already talked about non-discrimination, not to exclude and leave behind um, some children. The best interest of the child is a way to ensure policies. The impact for children is understood in an adult-oriented policy, and I'm glad you're looking at each law with that lens. That's a, a good start. The focus on developing the full potential of every child. Again, evolving capacities can help us with some of the age issues we're challenged with about in Canada, whether it's marijuana or MAID or all of those um, issues. The convention moves from protection to self-determination, so it's a development paradigm <coughs> that's helpful. And there is the right to be heard and participate, which the Senate has championed in the past. After the tribunal ruling, which we heard about, and the 60 scoop cases, which I expect most of you know about, Canada cannot say again that the current system works well enough. The first area to change is data. I've just listed some of the recommendations in the last report about data. We still have not seen data that was missing five years ago and that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission called for three years ago. And that deals with how many children are in care in this country. We did not have accurate data five years ago. We still have not seen accurate data. <coughs> it is a sad commentary that I can find better information about the state of cows in this country than our children. Where's the solution? The coalition is suggesting a systems approach, not one thing. I think for too long we thought if we've just had one office, we would get children's rights. We are recommending a systems approach. At the very beginning, if we had a child rights impact assessment before any law and policy that affects children was passed, we would look at all the impacts at the beginning for prevention. Canada cannot say again either that an interdepartmental working group on children's rights is adequate coordination between departments. I imagine you are seeing the lack of coordination as well. We need some kind of senior level body. A children's budget, and we can talk about some of the other um, tools 
to implement, but it has to be a systems approach. I think for too long we say, oh, if we just teach children about their rights, then it'll happen. That's not enough. We need to change the systems as well as teaching children. And it isn't going to happen if we just have an office somewhere. It has to be a change throughout. I wanted to mention about the right to be heard because the Senate has championed this over the years. We have made some progress. We need to acknowledge progress made. For the first time this year, the requirement to consider the views of the child is included in proposed federal legislation. This is the law dealing with a family law. That's good news, and it's a good step forward. If we did the second recommendation that was in the report, which is establish an appeal mechanism if children's views are not considered. Now that would make big change and have ripple effects. <coughs> Violence against girls is on your agenda, so I wanted to look at what the Convention contributes. The Convention asks us to prevent all forms of violence. It has recommended for three times that we do that with a national approach. There also was a very specific recommendation about effective follow-up after family reintegration. Sadly, we have seen deaths of children in Canada since that report was issued because of lack of this measure. But mostly, I want to point to the fact that there is international evidence to show that it is most effective to take an Article 19 approach. That evidence is an accumulating. Canada can learn from other countries. <coughs> That's why I said upstairs, sometimes we're a bit slow to learn, I think. I wanted to mention um, the focus on physical punishment because I know the Senate has considered that matter. Canada is falling behind other countries. The number of countries um, who have now made that change and are seeing positive results from it. We're talking about well-being. The article on health is important. It focuses on the social determinants of health. There's a very strong focus in the convention, and that contributes to something that we, we know we need for children and we don't have in our current health care. It also has some specific recommendations. I note one was about counseling services in all schools. That would address some of the issues we heard earlier about mental health um, for children. But for governments, it can provide the grounding for the kind of preventive measures and community health services <coughs> that we know benefit children and don't come through the Health Care Act we have now. I'm just going to mention two very specific ones. One dealt with regulating um, unhealthy food to children. The Senate has discussed this matter. If the best interests of child, if children was really given high priority, I suspect the bill would not be held up because of revenue issues by advertising companies. A second one was to monitor the use of psychostimulants to children. This relates to the issues we're dealing with across the country about drug dependency. A recommendation was made five years ago based on evidence we brought to the committee. I asked about a year ago and nothing had been done about it. In the standard of living, the committee recommended annual targets to reduce child poverty. Why? Because that is what has worked in other countries to actually reach the goal that we've struggled to reach. Yesterday, a poverty plan was tabled in, in the House of Commons. Uh, with some long-term targets, it's a good start. Perhaps we need some shorter-term targets to move the bar for children. Canada was asked to address equi equitable impact of child benefits. There's a new report out showing that the Canada Child Benefit, which we're all happy about and it was a good move, it is excluding some children. If a children's rights impact analysis had been done, we could have prevented that. And then there is the question of ensuring funding, which you heard from my colleague over here. So where are the directions for change as I see them? I think if all of us begin to use the convention explicitly, consistently, 
and persistently. If we use rights as an asset, as a tool to make change, to make federalism work, not as an extra burden or a paper reporting project, but really use it as a tool. <coughs> and finally, I think we need to develop strategies for awareness, political will, and system reform all at the same time, not focus on one thing and hope everything else will fall from that. Thank you very much, and I look forward to questions. Thank you very much to our panelists. You certainly provided a lot of information to us. And just a reminder to senators around the table, if you wish to ask a question, just raise your hand so that we can uh, put your name on the list. And if you're in the audience and you wish to make a comment or ask a question, just let Sarah know. We're going to begin with Senator Munson. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your testimony this morning. And uh, I walked away this morning from our uh, National Child Day breakfast with a whole lot of optimism and uh, seeing the glee, exceptional choir singing uh, started our day off on, on the right foot. But an hour later, um, echoes of pessimism creep into my soul because I feel that we, we live in the Stone Age. Um, I was going to ask all of these questions that would have good answers, I know, on the idea of a National Children's Commissioner. We've fought for that with our Human Rights Committee here in the Senate. We, the children's budget sounds fascinating to do. You talked about the PBO officer. I think there's a, a mechanism there that a senator or a member of parliament can ask the PBO officer to, be, to do that for that particular MP or senator. And that, in that way, that can get itself out into the public domain about uh, the rights of the child. And I was going to ask questions like, where are we failing? But I just took a look at uh, an opinion piece from Andre Picard. And the reason why I stay Stone Age is that in his official statement on National Child Day, I think it was a year or so ago, Prime Minister Trudeau said, each child deserves to be raised in an environment that is free of violence, discrimination, and exploitation. So why does Canadian law still allow parents to spank their children? Spank their children, hurt their children, hurt their self-esteem, and hurt their bodies. There was a recent report in the United States just uh, this week about the psychological effects that happens when you're spanking your child. Um, we in the Senate have had the opportunity over and over again to repeal uh, Section 43, and we can't seem to get there. And I do think that we have to have a collective will in the Senate to push this over the top. This is the last, we're in the last ten, nine or ten days of, of uh, nine, nine or ten months before the next election. I mean, we have to get this out here. So I want to ask you all, uh, uh, I, I know what the answer will be, but we've, we've got to push this. This is one, one area, one fundamental area. Can I get your views? Anybody can enter this. It's part of the Truth and Reconciliation Report as a uh, uh, piece of a history that should not have, should, should be uh, eliminated. I'm just, um, so we have quite a few uh, senators that are on our list and so I'd ask that you be, um, ask your questions d'une façon succincte and also I'd ask my, the panelists to be uh, um, have uh, a brief, an answer, a complete answer, but uh, also. Sorry, I got so uh, passionate about this. It really <laughs> thank you. Pees, pees me off. <laughs> Dan Van der Grift. Well, I I'm happy to work with you in any way to get this one done. That's for sure. I was really disappointed when Canada reported in response to its uh, Universal Periodic Review, um, um, where they were also asked to do this. Um, and again, made some small distinction about abuse and, and physical pain. The, the, the research evidence is very clear about the direction to go. Um, and if we take Article 19, which is prevent all forms of violence against children and set that as a standard, I think that's a way to get this done. I think Canadians will rally around a campaign to prevent all forms of violence against children. All forms. Otherwise, we get hung up on kind of futile debates that get very emotional, that get angry, uh, and we don't move. 
but I think Canadians are ready to look at something that would look at, let's prevent all forms of violence against children and rally. So that's where we think we may be able to make uh, a positive goal. Any other comments? Uh, yes, we support um, the full implementation of children's rights, which means they will live without uh, fear of violence or, or violence uh, against them. Madame, uh, I guess I would just agree with, <clears throat> when we talk about the full implementation of <clears throat> the UN Charter, then it goes along with uh, no violence, as they said as well. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I was say, Ms. Van der Graaff is talking about research evidence for this. There's excessive evidence that shows that it takes 10 to 20 years before research evidence is actually implemented into practice. And there's been a series of, of studies that are convincing to show that the impact of this would actually be incredibly beneficial to Canada's children. And I think there's a unique opportunity here in the Senate to actually take change on that on that action item and, and hopefully actually improve the health and well-being of, of Canada's kids. Merci. Uh, Senator Pate. Thank you very much and thank you to all of you for being here and, and thank you to both of you for chairing. Um, and Senator Munson for, and all of you for hosting this morning. Um, I wanted to ask, um, we know that uh, something that you, uh, you talked a bit about when you talked about the poverty strategy, but, and so in, in particular, Ms. Spandegrift, I'd like you to speak to it, but everybody as well. Um, in, and uh, Ms. Oja, you did as well, and I know the First Nations Caring Society has done a lot of work in this area, but um, young people come with parents and, and in particular many of the young people we're talking about have single moms um, who are raising them and it strikes me that some of the work that um, through various committees that I've had the privilege of doing in the last little while um, showing that um, not only are the issues that you've raised but 60 percent of the young women who are in juvenile custody are indigenous young people, the rising number of other racialized young girls, and almost all of them poor, almost all of them first in the child welfare system. And it, one of the areas that um, you've all talked about <coughs> is uh, some of the human and social costs, but also the fiscal costs. And I'm wondering if you've looked at combining with some of your analyses, some of the work that's been being done on guaranteed livable incomes and the importance of providing those opportunities in addition to the adequate resourcing for particular groups like um, the First Nations Caring Society has been doing for First Nations children. And, and if, if you have, how you've combined that with the sustainable development goals and, and your overall analysis, because it strikes me as an area that we may want to explore further. Ms. Oje, would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, for us, we often, often parents will be looked at in terms of um, their own um, individual deficits, and this kind of relates to the to the first question as well. And for us, we believe that it's systemic issues such as poverty, poor housing, caregiver substance misuse. Those are the key reasons why why First Nations young people end up in the system. Um, so we believe investing in those kinds of things, making sure that child welfare care doesn't remove children um, because they're poor or because they have inadequate housing, really needs to be addressed. Um, and so that's why it's so important for us um, to look at the tribunal ruling and to fund those First Nations agencies adequately so that they can provide services on reserve to First Nations children and their families. Um, because often those agencies, especially in remote communities, they're the only um, service provider available on reserve. So I don't have a specific question, but I think, um, or a specific answer to your question, Senator Pate, but um, I think funding those agencies would help, um, um, and agencies are able to provide those services to the mothers who are um, in need of, of additional funding. Child poverty does have to fit within the larger national poverty plan, but we, we also argue there need to be more indicators for children as well. So we don't lump it in, but it needs to be part of the, of the larger. And so it is tied to um, living wage. But I'm also, when you mentioned single mothers and so on, you know, it is looking at that whole picture which the convention gives us. Some of the changes that are coming in family law are going to make a difference in putting the best interests of children first in those situations. So there isn't, 
just one measure, but um, when it comes to the national poverty strategy, we would like to see multiple indicators for children so that we do look at um, a range of factors for, for children, but also their households. Um, so it's not one or the other. But any, any other comments, uh, uh, Madame Lovelace? Yes, thank you. I will just echo uh, what my colleagues have said and also uh, underline uh, the importance of collecting the data across the system so that that data uh, can then show us the actual picture um, because, of course, we at this point in time cannot do that across this country. Um, and so I just want to underline uh, the, you know, underscore the importance of actually accessing, collecting and analyzing the data that's out there or, or that should be available. Thank you. Sorry, um, just um, so, sorry. I don't know. R rising from that, uh, Ms. Lovelace, um, there is certainly a lot of data about how much is being spent on child welfare and the uh, seemingly endless resources for jailing and seizing children, but not necessarily the resources for doing the types of interventions that would prevent young people from ending up in care. And so that's some of what I was. Uh, so I apologize if I wasn't clear in, enough in articulating that. May I? Yes. Okay. <laughs> within within a, uh, a week, we, we're going to be releasing a discussion paper on child welfare, and we think provincial child welfare systems need fundamental reform mm -hmm. in line with that area. So I think there's a little bit of a narrative now which says we do pretty well in Canada except for Indigenous children, and that's a federal government problem. Well, frankly, provincial child welfare systems need to take children's rights, and we've started looking at the legislation, and they do not. And if they did, they also would move upstream in terms of how they would help families. And, um, you know, so it, it could save money in the long run. Now, we, have, we don't have enough data to do all those numbers, but certainly I think a good start would be to bring our provincial child welfare systems in line with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So, and again, that's part of why I think the Convention can help us make federalism work better. A lot of focus was put on the federal Indigenous, and that's very appropriate. But provincial systems are not working well either. Senator Belmare, you have a question? Yes, I'm interested in the notion of the law. Here, we have a slide that gives us directions for change. And rights are an asset that can help federalism function better. As asset to make federalism work. I find that interesting. I find it to be a very strong statement. And I'm hoping that you could explain to me how you see that, how you see rights, how we can raise the notion of rights and give it a status. Because I agree with Senator Munson. When we listen to you, when we hear what's being said, when we see what's happening in Canada, Yes, we are certainly in the Stone Age on several levels. And we are very civilized, and yet we have very few backstops to prevent this. I would like you to tell me about the notion of rights and what the Senate can do in this matter. Someone's ready to tackle the question? Why do, why? We feel quite strongly about this one right now, and I think um, getting some resonance to that question. Children's rights can make federalism work better. Um, if you talk about national standards, it doesn't go anywhere in this country, if I talk honestly, right? But if you talk about focusing on outcomes with the kind of accountabilities that come through rights mechanisms, you allow flexibility for provinces to be different and yet we have some accountability across the country. So that's one way that it can really help. Um, because often we, you know, you will see in the Senate, in the committee's reports from the UN, they'll talk about national plan or national, you know what, it never happens in this country because there's always a fear of the provinces. But if you 
really use the outcome measures under the convention and the accountability <coughs> tools under the convention. Provinces are also duty bearers, so they um, come to bear. But you can allow flexibility in how you get there. Another, just practically, if we were to use those mechanisms, um, when Canada was moving for the Canada Child Benefit, which we worked for for years, there was great fear provinces were going to take the money back under the provincial systems. Well, if you, propose, if you pursue it in a rights-based way, you engage the rights holders. In this case, they engaged us. We contacted all the provinces and said, please don't do that this time. We started to publicly report what provinces answered. Public accountability yes. matters. So if a province, in the end, no province did this last round. So there are ways of using the tools that come with rights to make things work. Also because every child's policy has provincial and federal aspects to it. So if you don't, we hear a lot of kids falling through the gaps. And so I think it's a way of making the system work with enough flexibility for provinces, but yet a common purpose and a common set of measures. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes uh, complete sense to me. <laughs> and what uh, could we do to, to encourage that? To well, as soon as. We should protest on Parliament Hill. I was um, earlier had uh, tried to reach the Human Rights Committee. I'm hoping you might ask for a meeting with the officials on this report before it goes to Geneva. Mm -hmm. um, we will we'll gladly give you the questions to ask. <laughs> um, why can't you ask the people who are responsible? You are the ultimate guardians of children's rights, as well as where is the report? We'd like you to come and tell us what's in it. This Senate did a three-year study on children's rights. You have lots of credibility on this issue many years ago. If you ask them to come, we will come, and we could have a, but if you have a discussion before they go to Geneva, and then when they come back from Geneva again, mm -hmm. so that change happens here. And it's not good enough that it's an obscure committee that does federal provincial coordination. Do any of you know that there is something called a continuing committee of officials for human rights? Have you ever heard of them? Yeah. Well, I've appeared before them, tried. <laughs> it's not good enough. And I think if you said that body, that is not good enough. We need some effective coordination that, where we can actually move things. There is this. Does that? Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Madame Lovelace, est-ce que vous voulez commenter? Ms. Lovelace, would you like to comment? Any other comments? Oui, Madame Mitten. Well, just add um, what Kathy was speaking to, and when you look at the idea of a children's commissioner, that 60 other countries have these in place, and when you look at some of the examples, there's actually evidence base that proves that it has increased child well-being within those countries. So there is there is a lot we can learn from other places and the, and the effectiveness to have a body that would actually, that is what they're looking at is the coordination in the different pieces uh, to have more effectiveness to actually make those changes. So Senator Bern uh, Thomas Bernard, you have a question and then we'll go to the audience. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all for your presentations this morning. I've appreciated the conversation, but like uh, Senator Munson, I find myself um, always feeling very discouraged because we just don't seem to be able to get the traction to move forward. I could ask a number of questions, but I think I'll pick up on uh, the question that Senator Pate was asking and uh, in response to the statement that the convention says that we should prevent all forms of violence against children. And I'd like to, for the record, have some conversation about state violence against children. When systems put more resources into services like child welfare that have the power to remove children from their homes, 
instead of providing supports and resources to keep those children with their families, especially single mothers. We know there's an overrepresentation of First Nations children in care in this country. There's also documentation that there's overrepresentation of African Canadian children. And we also know that for many of these families, the, the, the root of it is actually poverty. And yet, we're just not seeing the traction to address it. I think it makes us feel good when we can talk about lifting children out of child poverty. But let's be real, children don't live in poverty. They live with their parents who are in poverty, and many of them are single mothers. I grew up in poverty. I grew up in poverty. When I think about it, and I think about what allowed us to move forward, there are very clear things uh, that happened in our family. And I don't know why we didn't end up in the child welfare system. I think we had a, had a mother who was incredibly strong, who was widowed at the age of 39 with 12 children under the age of 18. I don't know what she did, but I think we, there are lessons that we can learn from the resilience of mothers like mine uh, who managed to break through these systemic barriers. So I, I'm sorry, I, that's, where's my question in that? <laughs> And I really didn't plan to even go there. Um, the question is really, what do we do about state violence against children when we don't even dare name it as such? Thank you, Senator Bernard, for that, for sharing your story. I think it was really powerful for all of us to hear. Um, so in terms of, um, I can't speak to um, other children in the country, but in terms of First Nations um, agencies, for example, they do provide prevention services as well. So that's part of their mandate. So not only to cover um, removal, because obviously agencies don't want um, children removed from communities and families. That's really one of the th things we hear often is that they don't want um, removals. And so that's part of the tribunal ruling was to look at how to fund prevention services for the agencies so that we wouldn't have to um, remove children from, from their homes. So um, I think in terms of that, that really covers um, the agencies so that there is less children overrepresented um, in child welfare care. And in addition, um, Jordan's principal um, also has funding for communities themselves to deliver um, programs and services that focus on prevention. So that um, a lot of, so what, what ends up happening for a lot of First Nations kids is they end up having to be removed from the home in order to access services. So under Jordan's principle, um, it's about providing those services to First Nations kids um, regardless of whether they're in the care of, of First Nations Child Welfare. Um, so providing funding to communities to actually pr provide those services, those prevention services, so that they don't have to even um, go into, into the care of child welfare and that they have those services in their communities. So I hope that gives you some clarification or so. Any other, <laughs> any other comments? I have uh, Sen uh, uh, Senator, I'm sorry. <laughs> Madame Lovelace. Merci. Um, yes, I would like to uh, thank you. I, I echo what you've said, and I would also like to add the uh, the importance of recognizing the inequities across the country when it comes to the provinces. Some provinces have advocates uh, for children. They're uh, they're actively adjusting their systems, uh, um, collecting data, ensuring that um, they're well aware of what is happening within the community, what programs are available, and and uh, what resources are available. Other provinces, like my own in Nova Scotia. We do not have a children's advocate, so uh, it's difficult uh, to look at the overall um, system within the province. So I think it's important to recognize the inequities that exist across the country. Thank you. Madame Metcalf, and also Madame Van der Grift. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments. I also just wanted to highlight that there's some exciting research opportunities that are showing different ways to target some of the child poverty and ways that we can address that. There's been some exciting work coming out of the University of Manitoba that is specifically targeting low-income pregnant women that actually shows by providing low-income pregnant women with, a, with 
a modest stipend. I think they were giving them $80 a week. Uh, and then giving those women the autonomy to act with that money for how they felt was best for themselves and their, family, and their families actually went on to actually improve like birth outcomes for these children, which then related to better improved outcomes for these children as they age too. Some women use this money to pay down debt. Some women use this money to buy food for their families. But part of it was actually having the income that they could use to address their needs, but also the autonomy to act on what they felt was the most important things for them and their family. And looking at other pilot projects like that, that give, give some autonomy back to families and actually give them some leverage to act on behalf of themselves and on their children. Um, Maybe a different policy lens are a different opportunity than we've taken before. Thank you. Briefly? I, yes. I just wanted to highlight that the convention is actually very strong on support for families. So it, it does, you know, that's just not being implemented. Mm -hmm. It talks about the family is the first support and only the last resort should a child be removed. That's why I say provincial child welfare systems are not compliant with the convention. The first mode under the convention is to support the family unit. Okay. So, and there are there are those, and of course we know, um, you know, some other basic income projects. The research shows that there's good return for doing that. Merci. Uh, we're now going to go to the audience, uh, and the first person who has a question is former Senator Landon Pearson, and just go to the mic that's just in front of you. Thank you. Thank you for all your presentations. Uh, I think there was a lot of clarity. I, it takes me back, though, to the last two years that I was here in the Senate, as you will remember, when we did those three, those two studies on the implementation of the Convention in Canada. And my goodness, that's 13, 14, 15 years ago. The titles are important because the title of the first report was Who's in Charge Here? This, were, uh, this is addressed to the federal government, right? Who's in charge here? Who, in fact, is in charge of making sure that the Convention on the Rights of the Child is implemented in Canada from the federal level? The second title, uh, second report, the final report was called Children as Silenced Citizens. So that was a report that suggested we were not listening to children enough. And, <clears throat> Both reports had some really good recommendations in them. They've been sitting there, and some of them have been implemented. I'm not going to say that after 13 years there's not been progress, because there has been progress, but there's still a real role for the Senate, I think. Now, that role has two pieces. Before I started the International Year of the Child, some of you, would remember, it's 1979. I went around the country talking to kids, and the ones who had done really well, I mean, who felt they were doing well, had two messages. The first one was that they had one person, at least, in their life who was there, engaged in what Yuri Bronfenbrenner, the great developmental psychologist, used to say, an increasingly complicated game of ping pong with them that is interactive, it's the duration, active listening, active interaction with children. The second thing they, so, so what these kids said is they always had at least one person in their life who was there for them. So one of the jobs in, in systems is to make sure that they don't have 65 people who are looking after them. Let's focus on building the relationships that are so important for human rights to be realized, because human rights are about relationships. Now, the second thing they said was, we always had a chance in our families to have some kind of say. Right from the beginning, we were able, whether it was something very simple in terms of, uh, well, I'd hate to say, not really making a choice about whether you're going to eat your meal or not, it wasn't that. <laughs> but when there were family decisions about holidays or or moving or something, the children always had their voice heard. That's what they said. And that was the empowering thing. That's what Kathy Evanagrift has been talking about, is the need, the best interests of the child require that you listen 
to what the child says and that you listen in ways to build that capacity that my granddaughter spoke about earlier, uh, that all children have capacity to be active citizens into a capability. That is, you provide as a society, as parents, as individuals, and as governments, you have to think about it in those ways. You have to keep that in frame because you can talk about services to the end of the, you know, end of the, or more money. That's really not the issue. The issue, of course, is sometimes more money, obviously, and services. But services, just as a word, does not describe quality. And the quality has to be in the relationship. And that's what we have to work for. So I think you have a really good opportunity. I'd love you to pick up this one again and do another study on how do we implement them? Because implementation is the issue. The framework is there. The convention is a framework. The issue is implementation. So all I can say is never give up. <laughs> Thank, thank you for your guidance and your suggestions to us, Senator Pearson. Uh, next audience person is Joe Gunn, a citizen for public justice. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, I can't resist the little comment or suggestion from the Senator's request for action. I wonder, uh, I know the Open Caucus wouldn't do something like uh, uh, getting involved in this type of way, but it would be incredibly important if the minister's office received 12 phone calls from senator's offices asking them, where's the report? Will you send it to me? I'm very interested in getting it yesterday. Uh, and I ask you to do this as a father whose baby works for a senator. Uh, please put him to good use. <laughs> My uh, question though for the panel, is rather, uh, you know, yesterday uh, C87 was presented in the House uh, for the first time after uh, twice that the UN called upon Canada to develop a poverty reduction plan for the country. We will have one. Uh, that will come before the House and, of course, the Senate. I wonder if the panelists would like to very specifically, I think some ideas have come forward, but very specifically suggest to us all, what do we need to see in that legislation to make sure that we get as robust a plan as possible that deals with the kinds of uh, issues you're involved in with children's rights. So what specific language needs to be there? What specific uh, elements have to address child poverty? What is the mandate of the council? Uh, somebody mentioned data uh, collection and representation on the council. What do we need to look for as we're trying to, in civil society or as senators, look at that legislation and make uh, uh, child rights really come forward in Canada's first ever poverty reduction plan. Thank you. Anybody? Thank you very much. I And if you get the report, I'd like to see it too. <laughs> um, what in that plan? I haven't had a chance to look at the um, the law in detail yet. I did note that they are suggesting that the advisory council have someone on it who is uh, addresses children's issues. So that's good. They're hopeful that's. But I'd like to see a clear reference still to children's rights. I think some of the positive things that were announced in the summer are some measures of accountability um, that we are going to be in the legislation, and, and that's helpful. We're concerned about the long time frame of the goals, you know, we're going to reduce it by 50%. Um, and then there's the long term goal. I recognize that lines up with the um, sustainable development goals. But the experience of other countries is that short term rolling targets, sometimes you move faster. So we think maybe it would be helpful to put some short term targets in with those long term targets to 2030. Remember, Parliament, all parliamentarians passed a resolution to end child poverty by the year 2000, and here we are. So mm -hmm. sometimes short-term targets focus the mind. Paul Martin used them for the deficit, and it focused the mind. We could use them for child poverty. We think there do need to be multiple measures. 
of poverty, not just dollars, as Landon said. Um, and so we would like to see a few of those measures relate to children. We do think that there, it's a combination of money, but also opportunities for children. So, you know, looking at it a little more holistically. So we want to see a few multiple indicators um, for children. Does that help? Thank, thank you, uh, Madame Angers. Thank you, Joe Gunn, for your question. Um, so this, for us, relates really to the parliamentary budget officer to publicly cost, publicly cost out all shortfalls for First Nations children, and as well to propose, propose solutions to fix it. Um, so I guess relating to um, Ms. Grunt Vandergriff's comments um, about short and long-term solutions, because obviously that would be a little bit of a longer-term solution. But we also believe that basic needs for First Nations children on reserve can be funded immediately and should be funded immediately because no child in the country should go without drinking water, um, adequate housing, or be unsafe in where they're living. Thank you. Any other comments? Ça va? Merci. Alors, uh, merci pour la question. Thank you for the question. From the audience, I have three other senators who wish to ask questions. First of all, Senator McCallum, Simons, and Benson. Senator McCallum. Thank you for your presentations um, and all the work that you do and have done for so many years. And um, I, I wanted to say how huge this problem is, and it's very difficult to grasp and try and see where we can get a foothold. I wanted to read something here. Um, as is well known, Durkheim demonstrated the importance of the social environment by studying one of the most individual and intimate behaviors imaginable, suicide. In his work, he noted that suicide rates in countries and groups exhibit a patterned regularity over time, even though in the individuals in these groups come and go. If suicide is a product of anguishing, intimate, and deeply personal problems, it is puzzling to see the rates that rates of suicide in these groups remain higher or lower even though individuals move in and out of the groups, he said the an that it w the answer was to be found in the social environment of these groups. And um, if study, if we tend to study risk factors in individuals and tend to focus in interventions on individual behavior, then it, it doesn't resolve the situation. The problem with this approach is that even if these interventions were completely successful, new people would continue to enter the at-risk population at an unaffected rate, which since we have done nothing to influence those fact forces in the community that caused the problem in the first place. My, um, I'm a health professional who's worked in the community for over 40 years and uh, on First Nations, so my comments are for First Nations. Um, there exists today discriminatory national policies uh, for First Nations, and these practices, policies are based on racism, and they continue to result in structural violence against First Nations children. Uh, what we need is a whole systemic change, which includes the medical, dental and the legal systems. When I look at the medical system and how doctors and mental health therapists work with our people, they, at the end, they create more disease than health outcomes, and that includes mental health, that we're creating mental health problems as we are treating our patients because we're not treating them holistically because there's a lot of reasons for that. And um, if we don't change the system, this threat to First Nations will continue to result in social murder. So when I look at 
at the First Nations people, there are so many areas like community, individual, the school, health, educational system, the infrastructure, and most importantly, spirituality, which has, um, which I believe needs to be have a big focus. With the inter, inter jurisdictional problems that exist, provincial systems are the ones that are taking away our children. And that self-government needs to be above the provincial system and on a parallel to federal, which is a study we're doing with First Nations. So I think, I don't know if there is a question I'm asking, but I think that I would, I'm, I would like to put my name forward to see if there's any way that I could help in this process because it's so huge and that different, there's so many different areas that I think that something should be put in place to help address, to help you. So if there's any way I can help, um, let me know. Thank you, Senator McCallum. That or um, they could help us um, get organized also. <laughs> Thank you for those comments. Would uh, anyone uh, would like to comment on, on her comments? Madame Ouge. Thank you, Senator McCallum, for um, sharing that with us. Um, for us at the Caring Society, we believe Jordan's principle is something that would be very helpful for a lot of the things that um, you've mentioned, um, especially in terms of providing adequate mental health services in First Nations communities, because as many of us know, um, the social environment in First Nations communities, especially when we're talking about remote communities that don't have access to what others have in the country, um, can be dire at times. Um, so I know I keep coming back to funding, but we believe that funding adequate mental health services and implementing Jordan's principle is one of the key ways that we can help First Nations kids at least have some support where they might not have support um, available to them. So for example, Jordan's principle can cover things like a mental health worker. Um, we heard about the tragic um, consequences of the federal government not providing funding in Wapakika First Nation. Um, to provide mental health counseling and two young girls were tr tragically killed themselves um, in that community and it could have been avoided and it could have been preventable and the government knew this and so this is why implementing fully Jordan's principle is so important for every First Nation in the country and we would definitely welcome the opportunity to work with you further so thank you so much. Uh, uh, Madame uh, Love. Other comments? Ms. Lovelace or Ms. Metcalf? Thank you so much for your comments. Su suicide prevention is actually, I think, of critical importance for our, for our children and youth, both First Nations and Métis and Inuit children as well as, as, well as non-Aboriginal children. Um, I think increasingly we also need to look towards the social determinants for health for that and recognize that suicide prevention cannot only occur in hospitals and in the healthcare system alone. We also need to look at techniques that are targeted specifically for youth and listen to youth as terms of what they think is actually going to be the best way to reach them. Increasingly the way that children and youth interact with, with adults and with professionals is different than the way that adults do. We have new technology with, with texting and with Twitter and social media that I think our healthcare prof professionals actually need to better integrate into, into their practice to better meet youth where they're at and with what their needs are um, and, do, and basically try to listen to what youth want to actually help prevent this and to take their recommendations under serious consideration. Merci, Madame yes. Lovelace. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator McCallum. I'll sign up with you. Uh, we, we desperately need to get this work done. We need to do this uh, not only for the youth, but their families uh, and their communities. Uh, at the National Suicide Prevention Conference St. John's uh, last week, uh, one of the things that struck me was, yes, it is complex, and we do need a comprehensive approach uh, to address uh, rising suicide rates. But we can see, uh, we do know from the province of Quebec, uh, how they can how they can reduce those rates. Uh, the province made it a priority. Uh, they they uh, were one of the, the 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 worst provinces across the country for the highest rates of suicide, a young uh, young people, and um, they made it a priority. 
and they reduced those rates with a comprehensive and complex solution that was primarily uh, community-based but integrated with health services. So I think it's it's important for us to use uh, you know that knowledge that we have, the wins that we've had, and to implement uh, some of that evidence and ensure that we do continue to shift uh, that culture um, into that uh, addressing the community-based initiatives and ensuring that we have the funding to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next questioner is Senator Simons. I'm too short for this test. Do I need to do this? No. <laughs> Up until three weeks ago, I was a journalist. And in that capacity, I sat down with Jane Philpott in February, just before the budget came out. And I asked her very hard questions about Jordan's principle and the differential funding for child welfare and for education on reserve. And she assured me, weeks before the budget, that the budget would completely make up the shortfall. And not only that, uh, she assured me that they would be making it retroactive to January 26, 2016, and that bands would be able to send in all of their bills and receipts retroactive to 2016. And then the budget came out, and I didn't quite see the funding in place for that. So I, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Auger and maybe Senator Francis, if he knows, whether what Jane Philpott told me in February ever came to pass. So just Thank you, Senator Simons. Um, so in terms of Jordan's principle, um, the Caring Society has been working with the Government of Canada to ensure that they're compliant with the tribunal rulings. There is indeed um, retroactive funding. Um, for Jordan's principle for um, agencies and families to submit, not only if they had submitted previously, but if there was, um, they found they had a Jordan's principle case before um, retroactively, then they could submit that as well. Um, we know that, um, I think the government didn't actually realize how many cases would come forward, because as you may have known as well, um, they had severely limited the definition of what Jordan's principle was. So um, it's gone through many different changes from the government of Canada in terms of where it was at. So um, at one point it was complex medical needs requiring multiple service providers. Um, the definition has been changing, but now I think the government has it right that it applies to all service, publicly funded services for First Nations children. So they have been um, starting to um, retroactively fund a lot of those services. But for us, what we find challenging is that I don't know if all families or, or organizations or agencies know that they're able to submit retroactive funding. So that's part of, um, there was a Jordan's Principal Summit in the end of September in Winnipeg. So just getting the information out to families for us is so important. Because at the time she told I'm still figuring out how this place works. At the time, she told me that they would not just cover those kinds of costs, but everything from the le legal expenses, parenting classes, and she said even physical repairs that had gone into, you know, First Nations Child Welfare office buildings. Um, and so I was just curious to know how, uh, and I wondered at the time how many agencies would have detailed receipts going back two years for expenses for which they never expected to be compensated. So I'm wondering how that compensation system is working. Um, I can't speak for the agencies themselves because, I mean, of course, they're individual, individually based and we have um, over 100 across the country um, spread out. Um, but. I think also um, agencies are able to look at, for example, um, what others were funded. So for example, if it was a staff position, um, they could look at what um, a social worker would be making in the province and submit retroactively in those terms as well. So there is a little more flexibility in terms of, I'm not sure about the receipts. Um, I could double check with, with Cindy about that. Um, I'm sure she would have a more in-depth answer than myself, but um, in terms of, you know, things like that where positions are funded at a certain level for the province, for example, um, where the agency can submit the retroactive funding based on that salary just to bring them up to cost. Right, thank you. So thank you. 
So, Senator, uh, thank you for the question and also your response, uh, Senator Labucane Benson. Uh, good morning. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, presentations today. I, um, I want to pick up on what Senator McCallum was talking about, about the social environment. And there's a lot of research now to show that the best interest of a child means being raised in environments where their individual and collective identities are intact, and that's in their communities. Um, that looks at indigenous healing strategies that are um, as important as the medical model. Um, that sees strength and capacity in families and that provides a living income for families. This is a highly decolonized way of thinking about chil children's services or child welfare. And um, I'm interested, Andrea, in number four and five of the Spirit Bear Plan that really speaks to the unpacking of colonial bias that exists not only in systems and generally in their policies, but in the day-to-day -day activities of frontline staff. Because even when um, policies change, and I sat on the ministerial panel in Alberta, and for context, the overrepresentation is 69% um, of, of children in the child welfare caseload in Alberta is Indigenous. And I have uh, watched that system attempt to transform and even with better policies, it's the day-to-day -day decisions of service providers that are often highly colonial and that don't see strength necessarily. And it's, so my question is, what are the best practices in number four and five around, you know, unpacking colonial bias? We're talking about discriminatory ide ideologies and policies here, but I would say that it's, we still, you know, bring up and reiterate colonial bias and it affects those decisions. So what would you say is a best practice in that area? Anyone that would like to tackle the, the question? I'm, I'm asking uh, Madame Roger, Roger, actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Yes. Madame Roger. Um, thank you, Senator Levikin Benson, for your question. Um, so I think support, first of all, um, before I get to the government piece, it's a matter of um, supporting First Nations agencies who are providing those culturally relevant services that are appropriate to um, First Nations young people. Um, and one of the things about Jordan's principle, when families need a service, they're able to actually choose their service provider um, in terms of in, ca in case they want um, something that's culturally relevant. So that's also a part of Jordan's principle. Um, in terms of the government departments, I totally agree with you and I think there needs to be a substantive reform within all government departments that are delivering services to First Nations children because the government, um, the Department of Indigenous Services has been functioning and serv giving services to children for over 150 years and we know this and they've had time to, to make a change and they need to, and they've had time to get into these ideologies, policies and practices that are discriminatory. And that really needs to change because we're talking about vulnerable kids. We're talking about children who don't have access to services like all other children in the country. They know that their services are discriminatory. Um, and what we're seeing now, in term, especially in terms of you know, um, Jordan's principle and things like that, you see a lot of good people who work in the government because we know that there are a lot, there are a lot of good people who want to do good work for First Nations kids. But then you see um, a lot of staff currently are overworked. So there needs to be more government department staff dedicated to these types of initiatives. Um, we also believe that they need to be trained in terms of what it means to have best interests of the, of the child, learning about Jordan's principle, learning about the tribunal ruling and what that means for them as employees, and really changing that worldview and that culture in the department um, for those children who are being serviced by Indigenous, indigenous services. Um, and so, you know, we see a lot of turnover in the department because workers are stressed, they can't, you know, they can't manage their workload. And so you have one really good person in a department and then you have changeover and then you have to start over again. Same thing when we have um, a government turnover. So, you know, it could be, and even with this current government, um, we know that Prime Minister Trudeau has committed to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. However, we haven't really seen substantive change. We've had five non-compliance orders with the tribunal. There shouldn't even had to have been those five non-compliance orders if there was a true commitment to reconciliation for First Nations children. 
And so with that, I think the spare part plan is really a, a great start um, to resolving a lot of those things that you've been, that you've spoken about. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's not just children's services. I uh, have had the opportunity to do training for um, 800 Edmonton Police Service staff. And I heard stories like uh, when we are called, because often the police and child welfare are called to a family. Uh, if I know it's an, an Indigenous family, we're, we're thinking about how to apprehend. And if we knew it was a white family, we were thinking about how do we help this family. These biases are in every service provider that touches families. So certainly Children's Services has their work cut out for them, but it's not just them. It's the police, it's everybody who is involved in some peripheral way in, in doing number four and five. Because to, to be able to action any of the other things people are talking about, like poverty reduction, we have to get to our colonial bias. Because we get into, I heard you say, the blame and shame game. You know, if, if the family looks like they're good, upstanding, non-Indigenous family, sure, we want to support them. But then if we mobilize our colonial ideas about Indigenous families, the idea is often to apprehend because we place a lot of um, assumptions on Indigenous families. I think to do any of this work, number four and five is kind of the starting. We have two, I think, uh, Ms. Vandergrift and Lovelace would like to comment. So, uh, Madame Vandergrift. I very much appreciate what you're saying, and I would say it's true for non-Indigenous children as well. And what the value of the convention is, is providing that more comprehensive framework that also looks at cultural, um, uh, you know, the cultural dimension, their right to their culture, their right to their identity. It, it looks at all of those factors. I hear that when I visit with African-Canadian um, communities. Um, we have a young woman volunteering with us now where the story goes the other way. I won't name her or her culture because I don't have her permission, but this, it is where she was left in a, 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 a non-healthy environment because the assumption was because that, you know, the family was doing very well. So it was another kind of cultural bias, right? So she was not listened to and was left. So we have both apprehension for cultural bias in this case, it was being left for cultural bias. But the convention actually says you look at all dimensions of the child and all their, their rights and together. And um, to cite a good example so that we don't leave everybody um, feeling dis depressed, we have a few centers operating under a social pediatrics model that are really taking the convention very seriously. Some in Montreal, one outside here. And they sit down with the child and the family around a kitchen table and talk about what's going on first. Not, first of all, the clinical model of healthcare. So I think there are ways of, of you know, re redoing that. Because I hear it from different cultural groups as well. Uh, okay, thank you. Ms. Lovelace. Thank you. Uh, I, was, I very much appreciate your comments and your questions. I think it's, it's just so important to be having this discussion. At Wisdom to Action, we believe that children and youth know their own pathways to wellness. They are the experts in their own lived experience. So they do need to be listened to and they do need to be respected. That voice must be heard. Um, in Nunavut, for example, we've been working with the Embrace Life Council uh, over the past couple of years, and you know it's 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 night and day. There is one psychologist in the entire territory, so access to service is the issue. Um, and and on top of that, the cultural safety, whether or not they feel safe to have those conversations with that outsider who has come in uh, to provide uh, or not provide a service, not having the ability to provide the service because they are so overworked. And um, you know, so we do believe that having uh, uh, you know, an anti-oppression framework to work within is extremely important for all training throughout the entire system in order to create that systemic change which is needed. And certainly I will ac uh, echo uh, Kathy's comments. Um, we're, we are, we need to do that for all racialized youth, all marginalized youth, um, and all with youth with all abilities to ensure that uh, we, we, we recognize their 
needs. Um, and I do want to also mention that uh, Wisdom to Action has been in conversation with the Edmonton Police Service um, to provide uh, services to them uh, to develop a youth engagement strategy which will help them uh, through the, the needed training uh, and also uh, understanding the, the, the comprehensive framework that's needed, not just for the staff, but for the everyone that works with those staff members um, to provide those services to youth, children and their families. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je vais prendre une dernière question, so one last question. Thank you very much. I will take one last question. Senator Hartley. Thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it and thank you for organizing this. And uh, it's been very interesting. In my former life, I was a social worker and worked a lot with uh, these issues. And remember in 2000, we were going to end poverty and here we are. Anyway, we can't give up. So I guess I was looking at uh, one of the things, I mean, there's so many things you said, but I guess what I was thinking when I heard you talking about, we're talking about uh, children and violence. I think you said Article 19 and uh, prevent, preventing all forms of violence against children. And one of the things that struck me and in my work before was the, uh, you know, the children they're witnessing and involved under domestic violence, family violence. And I think we talked about there was some evidence there. But I'm just wondering on that note, um, if, if there's something that the Senate could do in that note or move that forward somehow the uh, expose that issue because it is under children are, if they're living in a home where that they're exposed to that we're we're now realizing the impacts so if any of you could speak to that just some thoughts thank you I'm, Ms. Van der Grift. I'm, I'm pleased to see that the proposed reforms for family law take domestic violence seriously and do put the best interests of the child at the core. So I, that is one piece of legislation that I think has moved the bar forward. But I was shocked to now learn in looking at it that some provincial legislation on family violence does not refer to children, so only spouse. How did that happen? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so we need those pieces to come into play. But certainly we know that exposure to domestic violence is a major issue. And so I think the new legislation, take a look at it, I think it's better. Um, and we're now twigging, whoa, we need to do a lot of work. But that's why we need an Article 19. I, we are in discussion with a public health agency because we want to see us look at where are these gaps in Canada. And there is an uh, international network called End Violence Against Children. They do an an inspire framework it's called so you look at what the laws are where are you know the other pieces whether it's training we haven't done that i don't know why there is resistance to use article 19. you know when when uh, there was a briefing done about violence against girls no one made reference to article 19. i did say to them why don't we make reference to article 19. I think it may be this spanking issue, but then get rid of it. If it's holding us up so hugely, we're so scared of it that we don't do, you know, I think that I'm speculating. I just asked them, why is there no reference to preventing all forms of violence? So we begin to look at the gaps. What we fund, we fund very narrow initiatives. We have spent millions on bullying. If you look at the evaluation of bullying research, you know what it says? <laughs> You have to look at rights respecting relationships. That's the evaluation after we spent millions. So why the resistance? Maybe you could call them here and ask them. <laughs> Thank you. I can't. I can only ask them politely. And <laughs> we'll take that under advisement. Thank you. Ms. Lovelace. Said, um, rights respecting relationships is so important. And uh, so I'm just going to throw in another aspect, which we haven't really spoken about um, deeply today, which is the incarceration of youth. Yeah. And that in and of itself is a violence against children. Um, so uh, the importance, of course, of having trauma-informed care. What does that look like? What does that mean? Incarceration of youth, that is not trauma informed care in its current state, in its current form. So I think it's important that we also consider uh, how it is that we're helping youth um, and, uh, and, uh, and the system itself, which, which apparently we call justice, um, but uh, does not sit well at all with us. So thank you. Well,
Uh, thank you very much. Um, before we finish up today, I'd just like to say that it's Sarah Pollowin's last official day here at Open Caucus. And she has worked at Open Caucus for as the coordinator for about a year. But she's not leaving the Senate. She's going to work in the office of Senator Ravalia. And she has been a great addition and a tremendous help to our Open Caucus team. So, Sarah, thank you very much for the exceptional job that you have done. And our best wishes to you as you start working in another office. And thank you very much for all that you have done in promoting Open Caucus and in organizing our Open Caucus meetings. Alors, c'est à moi que... And so, mine is the honor and the pleasure to thank the panelists, Ms. Vandergrift, Ms. Auger, Ms. Lovelace, and Ms. Metcalf. Thank you so much. Presentation, very informative. Uh, there are a lot of takeaways. Uh, I think uh, we will, uh, there is certainly um, I, I interest, uh, and uh, we count on, <clears throat> on your support. You have highlighted all of the inequalities that exist in Canada's system. I think that we have a lot of work to do. I thank you for reminding us of our responsibilities as senators. Thank you very much. Your presentation, your presence here. Thank you. Thank you.